darling, it's me, that morbid maiden of the macabre, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Now, what comes unassembled, needs a good paint job, and is made of plastic? No, it's not me getting ready for a hot date. It's a collection of creepy monster model kits made by a company whose very name means up in lights. You guessed it, Aurora. In the 1960s, monster fans discovered that with a few bare bones hobby skills and a pocket full of change, they too could make their very own monsters courtesy of the world's greatest factory of preteen nightmares, the Aurora Plastics Company of West Hampstead, Long Island. As Universal Studios' classic horror films enjoyed an enormous popularity on late night television, Aurora decided to cash in on the creepy classic monster craze. In no time, the company test marketed its first horror related kit based on the ever popular Frankenstein monster. An instant smash the kit sold out in every hobby store in the country. By 1961, Aurora was manufacturing miniature monsters around the clock at a rate of three kits per minute. That's 8,000 monsters per day. Dr. Frankenstein would surely be proud. One year later, Dracula and the Wolfman were brought back from the dead in eerie detail. And death-like realism. Next came Aurora's versions of the mummy, the creature from the Black Lagoon, and the Phantom of the Opera, complete with rats and a bloody victim screaming for help in a dreary Paris dungeon. With the release of the Hunchback of Notre Dame model, Aurora encountered its first legal problem concerning the monster line. The box credits Universal Pictures, but up to that time, Universal had only produced the silent film version starring Lon Chaney in the title role. The box cover art depicted Anthony Quinn, as seen in a more recent but non-licensed version. A switch was demanded, and with a few strokes of the brush, a legally safer likeness was achieved. Few people seem to notice or object to the fact that neither the new box nor the model kit looked very much like anyone who ever played the role. The success of these styrene plastic superstars was due in no small part to their sculpting by the incredibly talented Bill Lemon and Ray Myers. The lavishly lurid box art, painted to blood-drenched perfection by the famed commercial artist James Bama, was another big reason kids were eager to shell out 98 cents for a glue-it-yourself monster kit. Bama painted 22 Aurora monster box covers during the 1960s. His striking use of water-based paints and vivid colors gave the monsters a lifelike quality that virtually screamed from hobby store shelves but things were about to get even bigger for Aurora. In 1964, the company released the biggest monster model kit of them all, the gigantic Frankenstein monster. Affectionately known to monster lovers everywhere as Big Frankie, this monster kit came complete with plastic chains, paints, brush, and a monster-sized price tag, $4.98 five times the cost of the other Aurora monster kits. No wonder hobby stores were reluctant to stock this baby. In fact, sales were so poor, Big Frankie was the first of the Aurora monster line to be recalled back to the cemetery. Today, it's the most prized and valuable of all the Aurora monster kits, fetching thousands of dollars, if you're lucky enough to dig one up. Aurora followed up this landmark kit with models based on two more of the screen's biggest stars, and we really mean the biggest. Godzilla, King of the Monsters, and the eighth wonder of the world, King Kong. Aurora even encouraged its legion of monster model makers to create their own dioramas with two sets of customizing kits. The first one featured assorted skulls, bats, bones, spiders, and of course, tombstones. 
The second one featured a hungry looking vulture and a mad dog, who was probably mad because all the bones he wanted to bury were in the other box. By 1965, Aurora got even more adept at creating monster mayhem. By combining America's then obsession with creepy creatures and custom cars, a new product line was born. There was Frankenstein's Fliver, Dracula's Dragster, Wolfman's Wagon, and even the Mummy's Chariot. Eventually, even King Kong and Godzilla came along for the ride. But perhaps even more ingenious was Aurora's decision to tie in their popular Monster Kit product line with another icon of monsterdom, Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. Several of the Aurora Monster Model Kits contained a coupon for a free sample issue. And advertised within the pages of the magazine was, of course, the entire line of Aurora Monster Kits. This cross-promotion soon led to a worldwide monster model-building contest, with the winning entry appearing on the cover of Famous Monsters. The winner was treated to a trip to Horrorwood, California. There, he would meet Forrest J. Ackerman, Famous Monsters editor, and even get a chance to visit the set of The Monsters. Why The Monsters? Well, how better to promote Aurora's new model kit, based on the spooky sitcom? By 1965, the Aurora product line also included the Bride of Frankenstein. Dr. Jekyll as Mr. Hyde. and the highly detailed Salem Witch. In 1966, Aurora created their very own original monster kit with the help of their friends at Famous Monsters. The result was the eerie, forgotten prisoner of Castle Mare. Whoa, this is one guy who really went on a hunger strike. But by 1968, the kids who made up Aurora's core audience now seemed more interested in building a Batman than a vampire who could turn himself into a bat. Superhero and science fiction kits were the craze, and Aurora expanded and diversified its popular series of figure kits designed to meet the ever-changing demand. Still, Aurora wasn't going to give up the ghost on their monster line. By adding spooky glow-in-the-dark plastic pieces to their kits, the Frightening Lightning series was born. Before long, the popular long boxes were replaced with spiffy new square box designs. The glow-in-the-dark gimmick worked, sales were brisk, and once again, Aurora had succeeded in bringing the monsters back from the dead. But even a mainstream company like Aurora was no stranger to controversy. In 1964, parents were outraged when Aurora released the Chamber of Horrors guillotine. Announced as the first in a line of kits based on the gruesome attractions at Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in London, the guillotine model boasted in ads that it really worked, right down to the hapless victim and his detachable head. It didn't take long before nervous retailers forced Aurora to cut the guillotine from their product line. In the early 70s, Aurora Plastics courted even more controversy when they released a gruesome line of kits entitled Monster Scenes. Parent groups and religious publications were horrified when they saw children playing with a scantily clad female victim and the torture devices she was meant to endure. There was a hanging cage, a razor-sharp pendulum, and even a pain parlor complete with hot pokers and branding irons. It wasn't long before the evil Dr. Deadly and his henchmen, who included the Frankenstein monster and Vampirella, were soon yanked from store shelves. In Canada, the victim kit even got a makeover by being repackaged under the rather curious and no less controversial title, Dr. Deadly's Daughter. As you might have guessed, 
The Monster Scenes series enjoys a huge popularity among Aurora fans and monster figure collectors. Original kits in pristine condition fetch prices that would have pained Dr. Deadly to even think about. In a last gasp effort to keep their monster kit product line alive, Aurora launched a whole new line of classic creatures. Now, with snap-together ease, kids could build a small army of ghouls. But to fans of Aurora's earlier efforts, these new monster kits were just not as well-crafted or as impressively packaged as the originals. Sales were unimpressive, which didn't help Aurora Plastics stay in business. The company closed its doors for good in 1977. Frankenstein, the Wolfman, the Mummy, and Dracula were forced back to their graves, perhaps never to be seen again. In the decades that followed, the Aurora Monster Kits became hard to find and much prized collectibles. Worldwide demand for vintage kits in original mint cello-wrapped splendor skyrocketed. Some brave monster makers even paid outrageous prices for sealed kits and built them. The fate of Aurora's molds was another matter. Most of them were thought to be melted down for scrap metal or lost in a now legendary train accident. Some turned up, in various incarnations, in modest reissues from Aurora's former arch-rival, Monogram. But in recent years, a company called Polar Lights arrived on the scene and began selling exact replicas of virtually every monster kit in Aurora's product line. Even the James Bama box art was restored to its rightful place of honor. Once again, hobby store shelves were haunted by specters in styrene plastic. A whole new generation of Dr. Frankensteins was born. And thousands of lovingly painted Frankensteins, Draculas, Wolfmen, and mummies were unleashed upon an unsuspecting world, just proving once and for all what the folks at Aurora Plastics like to claim. You just can't keep a good monster down.